anyway, again, we're still in the world of, in the, the age of film. And I know you guys wanted to hear about this sardine run. Yes. That started, that started with the shark obsession with white sharks. I went to South Africa for white sharks and I heard about this cinematographer named Charles Maxwell who filmed something called the sardine run that I never heard of. I don't think hardly anybody would heard of it before, but he was there near uh, Hansby where I was uh, staying to, to photograph the white sharks. So I got somebody to introduce me and he showed me this footage he'd shot that just blew my mind. This was what I'd been dreaming of. I'd seen footage of bait balls already that had been shot in Florida before they wiped out most of the billfish. They used to have sailfish bait balls just off the coast of South Florida oh. with sharks in them and everything. And then they, they killed the sailfish, they killed the sharks. They wiped out even the bait. So I, I heard of bait balls before, but even beyond that, I had this vision that, again, thinking of marine animals as wildlife, I, I knew there had to be wildlife spectacles, like right. the wildebeest migration across the Serengeti, where you have all the different predators coming in and all the herbivores feeding and running for their lives. And I saw the footage from Charles Maxwell and I said, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. This is what I have to, to, to cover. And there was one guy up there who had uh, taken Charles out and he was just ready to start doing this as a public kind of offering, open it up to the tourists. And uh, Charles footage went into a BSBC program. So the, at least the part of the world that watched the natural, natural history programs on the BBC was about to get an introduction to it. So I organized, I went up and I met the guy and uh, I talked to him about charting a boat. He said, yeah. I said, how many boats do you have? He said, I have one. I said, okay, well, I'm chartering your boat. And I chartered his boat and I, I chartered his spotter aircraft. Wow. And, uh, for, for two weeks and you know, that was it. I was gonna be the only person out there. Well, I, it hadn't occurred to me that there were a lot of other boats around <laughs> <laughs> he could lease and uh, other people could find out what he was doing and uh, lease their own boats. And I got down to his camp and there was a bunch of boats there and a bunch of people. And um, they were all listening in on the radio channel uh, or my spotter. Right. Aircraft was talking to me. It turned out to be quite challenging to get any pictures, uh, partly because of the crowds, but there were a lot of challenges there. If you go to picture 26, yeah. um, at, at these first camps where the, all the first sardine run trips uh, worked from, there were no docks, there were no rivers, there was, uh, you had to climb down a cliff, literally, down a, a trail on a steep cliff to get down to a beach where they'd park the boats up on the sand and we all pushed the boats on rollers to get them into the water and then we uh, we had all our expensive equipment loaded up in the boat hoping it wasn't going to flip over mm. when we got it through the surf we would when a wave would come in and the water would be deep enough to start the engines they would crank the engines up we'd all jump in the boat hoping we didn't get our feet chopped off as we were jumping in and hoping we could uh, crash through the waves and get out to sea. And it usually wasn't as bad as you see in this picture. In fact, none of us were brave enough to go out that day, but they did have to move one of the boats and get it back to the place where it had been leased from. So he, it took him about 45 minutes going back and forth, but he eventually, you know, got a, found a break between the sets and, and got out past that surf. Nasty. So I really got nothing my first year there. My second year, I uh, said, okay, two weeks is not enough. I went for three weeks, same thing, chartered my own boat. I shared it with a friend for part of that time. But again, it was an impossible situation with everybody jumping in on the same bait balls. And But at the end of the season, 
even my friend had gone home. So I was out there by myself. I started getting a few pictures. Uh, number 27 is one of those. We got a, a silhouette of a shark and a fur seal, both mm -hmm. working on this same bait ball. Um, the next picture, 28. Oh, now, the birds, yeah. the birds. you're wondering why these are all converted to black and white. Well, this, these are shot with ISO 400 film pushed one stop to 800. So giant grain, poor visibility, low contrast situation. It's, these are all so far away, it's all natural light. You yep. can use this drones. Anyway, what you're looking at there is a, a bait ball that's trying to rush up to escape the, the sharks below it. And then you've got the bubble trails from the gannets diving into it from above. Then uh, my last day there, if you go to picture 29. Uh, oh, wow. After, after everybody else had gone home, Charles Maxwell heard of, that I had got this bait ball the day before with the shark in the first seal. And he came back. And I couldn't, you know, it was all due to him that I was out there. I couldn't really say, no, you can't share my boat. So I was out there with just him. And I got the first underwater picture of a breedus whale feeding. Wow. And almost nobody had heard of breedus whales at that time. Uh, many people still have it. But I didn't get a great picture, as you can see. Uh, Charles got magnificent footage. And that was in the second BBC program about the sardine run. He, he did very well with that. But there were a, a lot of things going out there. Um, uh, it's still going on out there during the yeah. sardine run. There's a lot of life. If you go to picture 30, the uh, mega schools of the common dolphins. I uh, was lucky this freighter came by while I was out there so leaping. In, um, Perfect timing. Picture thirty, picture thirty-one. That's uh, common dolphins again on a bait ball. Right. And then uh, another thing that happened that year, if you go to picture thirty-two, was uh, Tony White uh, uh, made the first demonstration that uh, accidents can happen when you <laughs> jump in the middle of a giant feeding frenzy natural history right. event. Whoa, he, bronze he whaler got, or? Uh, bronze whaler, we believe, yeah. He'd gone into a, a bait ball with on snorkel, which in my mind is a huge mistake because you can't exit out the bottom. It was in very dirty water with low visibility. Once you get in among those bait, you can't get out because they follow you everywhere right. for protection. And the sharks are just mowing through them like lawnmowers. They, they can't see anything. It, in the water outside, you might have 15 foot visibility, but in the middle of the bait ball, there's you know, less than a foot. It's, the fish are right up against your mask. It's zero visibility. So that was an accident. And I don't have time to tell the whole story, but Tony, um, through a great string of lucky breaks, uh, came out OK. He uh, saved his life. He saved his arm. And he came back uh, the next year with a crew from uh, the National Geographic Channel to film the story of him getting up the courage to go back in a bait ball okay. after that happened, which uh, uh, played a part in my great success that year. So the next year was 2003. That was, uh, you can go ahead to the next picture, I guess, 33. Yeah. And that was, wow. I, I had, I got my first digital camera in 2002. And that's the one I took in 2003. That was a six megapixel Canon D60 camera. There's none of the major housing manufacturers even made a housing for it. So I, I got the housing from this guy named Uwe Kiel in Germany. He called them UK Germany housings. Okay. And, um, and so that was my first year shooting digital. And I chartered the boat for five weeks this time. Again, it was supposed to be the same deal. I was supposed to have my own aircraft and I was paying for my own boat, but all these other boats with six or eight divers were listening in on my channel and, and jumping in on my, uh, the bait balls that I found. 
And again, um, I just had a lucky break and it was due to a help from a friend, a uh, South African cinematographer named Peter Lamberti, who did, I think the first full video called the, about the sardine run called The Greatest Show on Earth. Wonderful guy, very generous, very nice. Again, uh, very unlike some of the competitive uh, cutthroat photographers you sometimes meet in this business called me in on uh, this huge bait ball that he had. There was another filmmaker working on that, but he ran out of batteries and had to leave. Oh, no. And when I got out there, Peter was, I waited for Peter to come up from his dive and he had to change batteries and film. He told me to go ahead. But my lucky break was that, uh, you know, uh, Tony was with this film crew from National Geographic TV. So they were you know, on a big budget, paying a lot of money each day, and they had the ax hanging over their heads if they didn't get the footage. It was their next to the last day out there. They were desperate, and they heard the chatter over the radio. They were headed out there, and I knew when they got there, I was going to get pushed out of the way. But uh, I think it was really because they ran out of fuel and had to turn around that I was able to get my winning shots. And this shot you're looking at, uh, not many people have seen this. It's not recognized. This actually won the um, the marine life category in the wildlife photographer of the year competition in 2004. Right. But uh, uh, I don't get much credit for that. I it, haven't made anything much on it. It's only been published once or twice. That's because it seems to be overshadowed by shot uh, 34 which really told the story I wanted to tell that when these events happen, these sharks are working hard, trying to get a meal while they can, and they're eating fish, which yeah. is what most sharks eat most of the time. Okay. And uh, as you know, that won the grand prize that same year. It was the first digital photo to ever win the grand prize in that competition. And I had to really prevail upon them to change their rules to even enter this photograph. Because initially uh, they had a rule, which they've since reinstated, that you had to enter raw pictures um, or you had to be able to provide a raw picture. And this picture was shot on a JPEG because I was shooting as fast as I could. And in those days, when you were shooting raw files, which were, you know, I don't know, eight times the size of a JPEG, right. they would clog up your buffer mm -hmm. and you would have to wait sometime, you know, six seconds or so for the buffer to clear before you could take another shot. And you just weren't going to get fast action then. So my only cho choice was to shoot JPEGs. And I shot, uh, I went through multiple flashcards. I shot hundreds of JPEGs. So... Again, if I'd been in this situation a year earlier shooting film, I couldn't have got the shot. Right. Um, but it's still, <laughs> it hurts me to this day. I don't have a raw of that. But uh, it's, uh, I how got a lot of mileage out of that one. How long were you in the water with that bait ball? To, uh, hours. Hours. I finally, I exhausted myself before uh, the bait ball quit entirely. Wow. And nice. eventually some other people did come out there. I just let them have it. Um, most of the sharks left for a while. The bottlenose dolphins came in. I got shots of the bottlenose dolphins in the bait ball. Um, those haven't done much for me. Oddly enough, when I showed the picture at the lodge that evening, nobody got very excited by this picture. They wow. liked the, the one before that I just showed you, but mm -hmm. I was convinced it was something special. So I showed it around. Sure. So I had that boat chartered for five weeks that year. And I think that happened in the first week or maybe the beginning of the second week. And then it was a long month of not much happening. And, uh, interspersed with some odd happenings, like uh, the next, next picture, a right whale came by. So there you go, a right whale on the sardine run. Amazing. Uh, I don't know if that's happened again, but anything's possible there. And um, uh, this one, the one that uh, you now. see in Patagonia? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, same kind, yeah. It's a southern right whale. And they're common on the around the, the Cape 
and a little ways up the the west tip of South Africa, but you don't usually see them, or at least at that time, didn't usually see them going up the East Coast. Okay. Uh, it's probably a, a relic population, a relic breeding population there. So it was traveling up to the breeding grounds, which I, I don't know if anybody to this day knows where they are for, for the right whales. And then, uh, as most people know now, there's a lot of humpbacks migrating through to their breeding grounds during the sardine run. Mm. And this was uh, my best breach of a humpback whale. And even though I was by this time living in Hawaii and had whales all around me working on a permit for whales, but the wonderful thing about this one to me is I didn't need permission from the government to photograph it. So I was really happy to get some whale breaches there. Thank you.